Okay, so now let's talk about this not being able to square root a number business. Um, you technically can square root anything. You can square root positive numbers, which I know you know. You can square root zero, which I know you know. But you can also square root negative numbers. So many, many, many years ago, a mathematician basically came up with a placeholder. It's really it. It's what variables are or like the symbol pi for that non-repeating, non-terminating, irrational number that we all know. We use the pi symbol as kind of a placeholder for this. Well, we use i as the placeholder for the square root of negative 1. We use i for imaginary number. This gets us into a whole other world of numbers. These are not numbers that you've known before. So we've got the set of real numbers, everything that you knew prior to this, and the set of imaginary numbers. Imaginary numbers stem directly from the square root of negative 1. Now, some people get lost in the transition between i being the square root of negative 1 and i squared being equal to negative 1. So let's work that out on the side. So starting with the definition, we know i is the square root of negative 1. Let's go ahead and square both sides. Operation. As long as you do it to one side, you get to do it to the other, you're good. Now, i squared is just i squared. Kind of like if you want to do x squared. Now, on the right-hand side, you and I both know that the square and the square root cancel each other out. So those two knock each other out. And that's where i squared equals negative 1 comes from. So we've basically got these two definitions. And it just kind of depends on the situation that you're in. Sometimes i itself is really all you need and sometimes i squared is what you need just depends so if we go through and take a look at this example that's worked out here x squared is equal to one well if we go through and we solve x squared excuse me x squared plus one if we solve that out we'd get x squared plus one is equal to zero move the one to the other side x squared is equal to negative 1. You want to get rid of the squared. And we know how to do that. That's the square root. But the rules haven't changed. You've got to put a plus or minus in front of it. So on the left-hand side, the square and the square root cancel. We get plus or minus the square root of negative 1. Aha! But we know that the square root of negative 1, right there, by definition, I. But don't forget to bring down the plus or minus. Now, if you wrote these as two separate things, you could say x is equal to positive i and x is equal to negative i. That's where they came up with it in the side over there. All right, so now, now that we know this business of i being the square root of negative 1 and i squared equal to negative 1, we can simplify things. So let's take a look at question number 1. So my recommendation is to separate, if you're talking about a square root like we are here, separate the negative and the 9 from each other. So we know that that's technically the square root of negative 1 times 9. We just kind of rip the sign off of it. But using what we already know, we can separate these. So that's the square root of negative 1 and the square root of 9. Well, the square root of negative 1 is i. Square root of 9 is 3. We can rewrite this. Typically, we rewrite it so it looks like 3 is a coefficient on i. I'm not saying that's what it is. I'm just saying it looks like it. And that's our answer. So the square root of negative 9 is actually 3i. All right, let's move on to number 2. Uh, number 2 doesn't look too fancy, but we do have this i business happening. So let's go ahead and multiply those out. Well, 5 and 3 gives me 15. And I want you to treat it like it's a variable. If you had 5x times 3x, you'd get 15x squared. So if we have 5i and 3i, it's 15i squared. But because there is a definition for i that is a numeric value, we never, ever leave i with an exponent on it, ever. So we're going to replace it. We know that we have the 15 the i squared, so i squared, we know the definition of i squared based on above. It's the one that we actually found. That's negative 1. 
So if we multiply those two together, this is technically negative 15. All right, see if you can do question number three. Oh, be careful. All right, obey order of operations here. So we're gonna keep the two i. Now the four i is gonna get squared. So I'm just gonna go ahead and write both of them out. Now let's multiply this all together. So I'm gonna get a two times a four, which is eight, and eight times four is 32. And then i times i times i is like x times x times x. So this is i, mm, I don't wanna do cubed. Let's do it as a squared. And then we'll just leave the other i hanging out because I have a replacement for i squared. So let's replace that i squared right there. So i squared, we know by definition, is negative 1. Just bring that i with us. Let's multiply these guys together. I think we get negative 32i now. Now, if I'd multiplied the i squared and the i, I would have gotten i cubed, but I'm not allowed to leave i with an exponent on it. So what I've, I would have had to break down the i cubed anyway. Okay, let's see if we can do 4. Now, I said treat them like they're variables. To me, this looks like 3 plus 2x times 4 minus 5x. I would draw the generic rectangle to actually multiply these out. So one of them is going to be the base. The other one is going to be the height. And multiply. That's 12. That's 8i negative 15i, and then the top right corner is negative 10i squared. We're going to have to clean that up, though. So, so far, we have a 12 combining like terms, a minus 7i, and a minus 10i squared, but we know what i squared is, so you got to replace it. It's 12 minus 7i minus 10 replace it with negative 1, obey order of operations, so 12 minus 7i, that becomes plus 10, now you have more like terms. Put the 12 and the 10 together. Now, we are not allowed to put real numbers like 22 with imaginary numbers like negative 7i, you can't combine them. Remember, think variables. If it was a 22 and a 7x, you wouldn't add those together, so we don't add these together. Okay, now back to the question that we left at 5.2.2. So this was one of the ones that we talked about, and back at 5.2.2, my answer was no real solution, which is still technically correct. This doesn't have any real solutions, but it does have imaginary solutions. So let's pick up and do what we would normally do. I'm going to move my negative 1 over a little bit so I've got some room. Got to get rid of the squared. So let's square root. Don't forget your plus or minus in front. Square and the square root cancel. And I also think we came to the realization that when you got rid of the squared, the parenthesis disappeared too. So it wasn't really necessary. Plus or minus. All right, we know the square root of negative 1 by definition. That's I. Last thing, move the 2 over. So we get x is equal to, I treat this the same way. The thing that I just added or subtracted, I put first. Plus or minus i. The 2 is real. The i is imaginary. You cannot actually add or subtract them together. That is the answer. So that finishes up 5.2.2. Now. We do have a new thing that we get to use, and this is kind of a mouthful, but I do want you to know that it is another way to be able to solve quadratics, and it is the quadratic formula. I personally prefer to refer to the quadratic formula as kind of the sledgehammer effect. It will work, like the completing the square method, it works every single time. So you could take something that is easily factorable and you can just beat it up with the quadratic formula. You'll get the same answer. The key is knowing how to plug stuff in or to extract the information that you need. So carefully, you need to make sure that it's in standard form. So ax squared plus bx plus c. Additionally, it must be equal to zero. 
If it's equal to anything else, this will not work. It's like using zero product property. It has to be equal to zero. So this equals zero, absolutely 100% imperative. It's not an option. It must be the case. Now, we go through and we identify the coefficients, so the numbers here. And then we know that a is the coefficient on x squared. We also know that b is the coefficient on x, and we know that c is the constant. So whatever number is being added or subtracted. Uh, be careful to pay attention to the signs on these guys as well. Very important. The quadratic formula, so this sledgehammer that we're talking about, um, you are only, 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 only going to be plugging in the numbers. So if you take a look at this, we're going to have all of these locations to plug in our Bs. And then we're going to have locations to plug in the A's. And then locations to plug in the C's. This is something that we are going to extract in class so you can see where it actually comes from. So this video is just more practicing. Okay, so first and foremost, you have to know what everything is. So let's identify our guys here. So one, is it equal to zero? Yes, thank goodness. No parentheses. You do not want this in factored form. You have to have it in standard form. Now let's identify our stuff. So A is the coefficient on the x squared. That's negative six. Don't bring the variable with you, it's just the number. B is the coefficient on your x term, which is negative five. And then last but not least, C is the constant, which is positive nine. From here, start plugging it in. So we have x is equal to our formula, which is negative B plus or minus a big square root symbol with b squared minus 4ac all inside and there is a denominator for this whole thing of 2a so now let's just cram everybody in where they go my recommendation is to use parentheses it should make your life easier so negative b all right well there's a negative sign already there now plug in the b plus or minus big square root. Use parentheses around the B when you plug it in. Squared minus four. Now the four A, C are all being multiplied together. So our A is the negative six and the C was our constant, which in this case is nine. Make sure that square root goes all the way across to close those guys in. Over, fraction goes under the whole thing. Okay, two, and then we're gonna have to put A in here. Now from here, it's just making sure that you multiply the correct things at the correct time. So first things first, let's handle the inside. So if we do x is equal to, I'm going to leave that negative, negative 5 alone. I'll come back to it in a minute. Plus or minus. All right. Let's type it in exactly as you wrote it down. Notice that I used the parentheses. So if I type this in, which I'm going to, I would open a set of parentheses, negative 5 inside, close the parentheses squared. Minus four, open the parentheses, negative six, close them. Open another one, nine inside, close it. I typed it in exactly as I wrote it down. And that is gonna be 241. Don't need my root to be so long anymore. And then I have two times negative six in the bottom. Now, let's go ahead and clean up some of the stuff on the outside. So I have a negative, negative five, which negative, negative is just a positive, plus or minus square root of 241 all over, and then two times negative six is negative 12. At this point, I would take a look at the directions to see, must I give the 
approximate answer or must I give the exact answer? If it's the exact answer, this is it. This is the exact answer. So if I write these out, got my exact solution. I'm just going to go ahead and push them together, just like I've got it right now. So 5 plus or minus the square root of 241 all over negative 12. That's exact. If you do the approximate answers, you just have to be careful here. So what we're going to do to type them in, we're do x is equal to, let's do the plus part. Now, my recommendation to you is to only type in the numerator first, but type it in exactly as you wrote it down. 5 plus the square root of 241. Now, don't write that down. Just have it in your calculator. Or if you're using Desmos, same thing. Just have it sitting there. This would have been 20.52 something, 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 something. That answer, we're now going to divide by negative 12. So now let's divide that by negative 12. I believe this is approximately negative 1.710. Do the same thing with the other one. x equals 5 minus square root of 241. So type that in first, get an answer. 5 minus square root of 241. That's negative 10 point something, something, something. Now take that solution and divide it by negative 12. So slowly, slowly, slowly kind of chipping away at the problem. You get 0.877. So we have our exact solutions here in the red box. And then we have our approximate solutions here in the blue box. So if you take a look at the nature of these answers, like these are terrible looking. They didn't come out nice. And by that, I mean like two thirds or negative seven, zero, five halves, something nice, not this long decimal that I had to round or truncate. That means that factoring wouldn't have worked in the first place at all, but quadratic formula will. Why don't you see if you can complete this one? Oh, but remember, you absolutely need to make sure that this is equal to zero. So subtract that 13 to the other side first. Practice plugging this into the quadratic formula and see what you get. Okay, double check your work against mine. I did go through and answer with both the exact solutions and with the approximate solutions as well. All right, now taking a look, this is the very last question that we're going to be doing for this set of notes. We're going to find the x-intercepts and the vertex of the parabola. So there are a couple of ways we can do this, but now we have a whole bunch of tools at our disposal. So if I want to find the x-intercepts, remember x-intercepts occur when y is 0. Okay, so that's the first thing I'm going to do. So let's take this equation and I'm going to turn the y into a 0. Now, at this point, you have three very different techniques that you could use. You could try factoring. And factoring is great, except it has its limitations. It's not always going to work. I'm not saying don't try it, because it might. The numbers are kind of small, so I would actually try it first. If it doesn't work, you could also do quadratic formula. Quadratic formula we know for sure is definitely going to work. It's the sledgehammer. You could also try completing the square. I would only warn against completing the square just because the coefficient on the x squared is a 2, which means we have to make two of the squares themselves. So it might take a little bit more work, which is fine. It'll still work no matter what. So why don't you choose your method and see what you can solve for when you solve for x here, knowing that we're finding x-intercepts. So you pick and come back and check your answer against mine. Okay, so I figured since the numbers were small, why not try factoring? And I got lucky. I could actually factor it, which was really nice. 
So I went through and I factored this. And so by factoring, I'm using zero product property. So I set my two factors equal to zero because who knows where the zero is. And I got x equals a half and x equals negative three. Regardless of whichever method you choose, you will get the exact same answers. But I'm not quite done yet because x-intercepts are written as points. So let's go ahead and write these as actual points. So one of the x-intercepts is going to be a half comma zero. And the other x-intercept is going to be negative three comma zero. Okay, now I need to find the vertex itself. So as we talked about in class, all you need is two points. They don't have to be the x-intercepts. They can be any two points as long as those two points have the same y value. So they have the same height in the graph. Well, these do. So in order to find the vertex, I am going to take those two x values and I'm going to average them. So I want to find dead center between the two. So I'm going to take the half and the negative 3. I'm going to add them up, and I'm going to divide by 2. Now, I don't know what the y value is. I have to figure out what that is. So let's go ahead and figure out what this is. So I've got 0.5 minus 3 is going to give me negative 2.5. I'm going to divide that by 2. Okay, so that's negative 1.25. So that is the x value of the vertex. To find the y, plug it in. So go back to your original equation, and everywhere you see an x, you're going to plug in a negative 1.25. So it's kind of like making a table, but we're not doing the whole thing. We're only finding the one specific value we want. So go ahead and plug this in, and let's see what we can get for the y value of the vertex. So I finished plugging this in. I got negative 6.125. So now I know what the vertex is.